are Zina and Amir. My husband and I run Amara Farm in the Comac Valley. Um, we've been there for eight years. Prior to us moving to the island, um, I grew up in Richmond and was farming there with an organization not um, not dissimilar to Shelter Farm. It's called the Sharing Farm in uh, Northwest Richmond, um, close to, well, on the, the dike's edge across from YBR. And I'm, I have a background, like my family didn't own farms, like nobody in my family, immediate family, has ever farmed. And so it was a bit of a, like, you're doing what? Like, why? <laughs> and so mystery, total mystery to, to my family, but I did study agriculture, um, which doesn't prepare you a lot for the day-to-day -day how to do things, but can kind of inform you of what, when things go wrong, why they went wrong. Doesn't prevent them from happening, but you kind of can figure out what's going on. Um, that's one of the benefits. But um, I met my husband in, in ag school, and we traveled around the world working as Kisa volunteers um, in third world countries. We went to Thailand, India, Bangladesh. Came back, uh, I worked for West Coast Seeds, and I see some Wow, practice. cool. Um, back when they were Territorial Seeds Canada, hmm. 1999, yeah. Um, and so I was their staff agrologist for two years. Uh, I had the opportunity of planting out the entire vegetable um, line in a demonstration garden. Wow. So we started the first demo garden. And so I knew at one time what every tomato tasted like <laughs> in the Western States. <laughs> well. It was pretty awesome. Um, cool. But I uh, had my kids, and so I had to kind of step back a little bit. And then I began volunteering for the sharing farm. Um, and one of the first pieces of infrastructure, like it's a, it's a farm that's on city of Richmond Parks land. Mm. And one of their first pieces of infrastructure they got with a grant from the um, Vancouver Foundation was a greenhouse just like this. Mm. And they built raised beds just like this. And um, it was kind of their um, spot to do a lot of programming, especially in the fall and winter mm. when it's so wet, nice sheltered area. And over time, the farm grew, and I believe they're now growing between three and four acres, primarily donating to the food bank in Richmond, running a CSA mm. to sort of fund their, their, their organization. Mm. So probably not dissimilar to what's mm -hmm. happening. And in 2010, I helped them start a farm school. So look at all the similarities. Yeah. Right? So working with that organization, um, also lots of volunteer groups would come, like United Way would send volunteer corporate groups to do their day of caring and volunteering in the community. So a lot of people just coming in and out of the farm. And so, you know, whenever things needed to be done, um, you had tons of hands, right? Hmm. Weeding, weeding 400 bed, bed feet of carrots, like, you know, they're just people doing it. And then my husband and I, you know, bought our farm and um, started farming on our own. And I was like, why isn't anything getting done here? Like, <laughs> where are my minions, right? There's, it's, everything is so slow when you're doing it on your own. Mm. And I think that's probably, for me, one of the first realizations. Like, I can't do this by myself. Um, there's just not enough of, like, my energy. I still, my kids were still young at the time, seven and ten, and so it occurred to me that I really need to bring others to help. And there's so many ways, like I, you're probably all learning, like the millions of skills that you have to have when you're farming, right? It's not just about figuring out what to plant and how to grow it, it's how to market it. It's like all the equipment that goes around, like putting up greenhouses and infrastructure and water lines and pumps and like it's endless, right? And so I don't, I don't have all of that knowledge. Um, between my husband and I, we've got maybe 70% of that, but still, you know, we needed to have more help in the community. So we just put it out to friends, you know, to kind of come and help us. And one of the initial uh, people that kind of connected with me was another farmer. Um, her name was Moss. And so Moss and I had very similar sized farms at the time. You know, we were kind of just starting out. And um, I knew how to run a CSA because I had done so in Richmond. 
Um, Moss already had a CSA, but her farm didn't have a ton of production. Whereas our farm, we bought it and it had four of these greenhouses on it. Wow. Which was like, yeah, it was nice. one of the deciding factors, right? So we had a lot of production. But I didn't know anybody in the Comox Valley when I moved there. So hmm. I had like zero network of customers where she had. She'd been there hmm. for about three years. So she already had an established CSA. Uh, with and she was struggling to produce like her farm um, was not like a lot of slobs a lot of cooch grass a lot of like a wow. lot of issues right whereas and I had greenhouses full of stuff that I couldn't sell all of it so for us to kind of work together it just a no-brainer right she's got the market I've got product so we started just going to market together having a joint table hmm. So, so that the stand looks full. I don't know. Do you, do you, I mean, you go to farmers markets? Yeah. You know how hard it is to sell that last yeah. <laughs> bunch of carrot, right? That, that, that one last. If there's nothing wrong with it, it's just there's just only one left, right? Yeah. It's this thing that like, psychologically people like to buy from abundant tables, right? Where you pile on stuff. And if you've got a little farm with like four or five zucchinis, yeah. Four or five, like, you know, it doesn't look abundant, but when you share with someone else, suddenly the stand looks full and lush, and it's eye catching. So right away, we saw that even separately, when we combined, our sales were higher than when we were apart. Hmm. Right, just because of that visual abundance that happens, and from there it grew to like me coming to her farm to help her out with. Um, labor that she just needed more hands and vice versa. We would just do that. And I think, you know, with you working here together with each other, you've probably seen some of the personalities and the types of folks that you jive with and it works for you. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, Moss and I were figuring each other out. It, I kind of like, it's akin to dating, right? It was a, like figuring each other out, our farm styles, mm -hmm. what you like to grow, what I like to grow and can we work together and we did that for about three years and then in the third year three other farms were like hey can we get into what you guys are doing because um, by that time we come up with a new name for our kind of partnership we called it Merville Organics mm. and the idea was to actually form a cooperative um, a formal cooperative both Moss and I were really um, Co-ops really appeal to both of us, the principles of co-op. Co so um, it took about three years, um, but three other farms said, yeah, you know, we're aligned. One of the things we needed any farm to join us to be was to start, I mean, they didn't have to be certified organic, but they had to start their application mm. process. Because both of us were committed to um, certified organic. Mm. And so the other farms that came in, um, all had that commitment and we're all on different paths to that hmm. and eventually what we did was we formed in 2015 a cooperative um, Merble Organics and we got um, you know our foundation papers and all of that process started mm -hmm. now um, you know there are you don't have to go that very formal route but there are pros and cons hmm. some of the pros are when you're a formal entity you can apply for grant dollars mm -hmm which is awesome, free money, who doesn't like free money. Um, the BC Ministry of Agriculture provides um, farm business planning for cooperatives. Mm. So that's a huge bonus. Mm. Like finding a farm planner is tough. Like that's expensive, mm. um, you know, knowledge um, for you to get out of. So there are uh, you know, folks with the ministry who are experienced both in farming and in cooperatives that can do help you with your business plan. Um, we found right away that Ben City, the credit union, was really um, wanting to support agricultural cooperatives. Mm. So they helped us set up a bank account. We had to go to Langford because there's no Ben City around here. Langford's the closest one. Okay. But they helped us set up a business account with zero fees. Like, wow. I mean, they really walk their talk when it comes to cooperative <laughs> principles, yeah. right? So they do that for other cooperatives. So right. no, um, no fees for the account. Um, they also funded us 
so that we could um, write our incorporation papers. So through the BC Co-op Association, they gave the Co-op Association a grant so that they could help us with our paperwork. Now, at the time, uh, the BC Co-op Association sent us a questionnaire that was three pages of questions of how you form your cooperative, like what are your principles, how do you get people into the co-op, how do people leave, I mean we just thought, oh my god, this is so yeah, much good. work, like yeah. three pages of questions. Mm. We, it took us probably two weeks of meeting and kind of hashing stuff out, like what are your shares, how, is it gonna, how much are you going to charge for shit, like we don't know all this stuff, right? Mm. So it took a while. And we thought, oh my god, okay, here, end of it, three pages. Well, they crunched all that stuff and gave us back our incorporation papers, mm. 61 pages. <laughs> like, oh my god, <laughs> thank you. And, <laughs> <laughs> like, how, like, there's no way we would have been able to do this paperwork, right? But they did it, wow. um, because they've got all the templates and they know the language that you're supposed to yeah. use. Excellent. And that's the notorious thing. Sadly, in, in BC, incorporating a cooperative is not like starting a society. It's mm. a very um, particular process in yeah. language. Like, they comb through right. all of the words. In fact, we had a few spelling mistakes and yeah. it got sent back to us. So yeah. you got to be really precise with that and have the sort of wording and system mm. in place. And thank God, like... You know, we'd only got sent back to us once, okay. corrected, sent it in again, accepted. That doesn't normally happen when you incorporate a cooperative. It's usually a back and forth a lot when you don't have the right people helping you out. So that was one of the other benefits. Um, uh, so 2015, this was 2015, our farmer's market had never had a cooperative market at their, their you know, venue and it created quite a pushback with our members so i remember one member a bit of a cranky old guy <laughs> saying you know what if we let people like you in it's a disadvantage for those of us who don't like working with other people <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well really wow uh, well, you know, I guess he had a point. Like, you know, he's got his table with all the things that he grows. <laughs> Thank you. For, you know, next to our table that has this abundance of stuff. He doesn't like working with other people. Mm. And I guess he doesn't want to sell to other people either, then. <laughs> <laughs> there are some farmers, you know, it, it's all kinds. So obviously, yes, it does, it does advantage people who... who move beyond the issues of working with other personalities, right? Um, there was some concern that this was just like wholesaling, that you're selling other people's stuff that you don't know yeah. how it was grown. Mm -hmm. So we had to make a commitment that each of us would farm at least, you know, once or twice a season on each other's farms. So we were ensuring, like, we could answer the public, like, what kind of melon is this? Like, we knew those answers. So, you know, Eventually, our co -op, our market gave in when they came up. When we said, actually, we're one business entity, like we are a, a registered co-op, and then that seemed to like, oh, well, you're just one. Okay, you're mm. not five. You're just one. <laughs> okay, if we had sort of said that in the beginning. Okay, <laughs> okay, and so that was another benefit of forming a formal cooperative. Mm. Um, you're not just a loose collection of people kind of coming in and out. Yeah. Mm. I guess the market was kind of concerned of quality control and just being able to answer to their customers. Like, who, who is this group, right? Mm. This ragtag group of people, Yeah, right? there's and some farmer's markets are kind of very sticky here in yeah. town about, you know, you're selling it, you have to grow it. Absolutely. So who's at the table? Or did they actually grow this? Where did it come from? So they have to be able to answer those answer questions. That. And that happens here. Absolutely. So. You yeah. know why, right? Yeah. I mean, you've seen it's some of the marketplace <laughs> and things that happen in, in Peterborough and other yeah. areas, yeah. right? Mm. So you can see why. Um, so that's how we got around that. You know, we did spend time on each other's farms and we could see what each other was growing. We do all our we do all our crop planning together. Mm. Okay, so can you imagine? You probably some of you have your own, you know, farming ventures. You hard enough doing yours. Can you imagine doing yours in alignment with four others? Hmm. So that there's some crops that you overlap, 
and there's some that don't. Mm -hmm. I have early crops from my greenhouses, but I want to let other people have some later. Like, it was, and we had a CSA whereby we wanted to have equal access to all of the farms. So sometimes that meant, um, you know, for each crop, everyone wanted a quarter, quarter, like salad mix. Who doesn't want to grow the high value salad mix, right? Mm -hmm. Well, having everyone have a quarter, a quarter, a quarter is what we kind of figured out mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, that evolved over time, but that's, those are some of the concessions that we kind of made for each other. Mm -hmm. Now, shall I talk about the cons? <laughs> um, obviously, if you do not like meetings and talking and working through stuff with other people, do not go down this route. Um, this is not something, if you, if you like making decisions and being like, okay, we're going to do it this way and let's go, <coughs> cooperatives are not like that. Right? You make decisions collectively and you have to wait until all of you have had your say before you choose a direction, right? It's like consensus, consensus. To, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, just because, oh, this opportunity came up, you can't say yes on behalf of the co-op. You have to check, you know, back with everybody. Even if you think, oh, for my farm, that would be awesome. But there's, there's not that immediate yes. So, you do have to understand that. Um, you know, there are different personalities. Like even in the beginning, when we're all the same size, I mean, you think that you're all the same, but you know, people are people. You've got different um, commitments to meetings, and sometimes the follow through is not there with everybody. People have different styles, right? And how do you make people accountable without pissing them off, right? You have to work with these people. Um, so I would say there is a lot of need for training in nonviolent communication mm -hmm. or just how to make decisions without hurting each other, right? How to call someone out when something happens and they didn't kind of do it, but in a supportive way. It's still something I struggle with, mm -hmm. I have to say. So be aware that when you are in a cooperative, those issues will absolutely come in. It's human nature, right, when you've got different personalities. Mm. And then I think the third one is um, your own personal farm visions, like where you want to be, like how big do you want to be? And you would think that wouldn't really matter if you're all kind of coming into a cooperative, but I'm going to tell you our story. So when we started the co-op, we were pretty much all the same size. I would say like we were making, you know, anywhere between fifteen to 30000 a year. And we did a strategic planning where each of us on our own came up with a vision. Where do you want your farm to be in three years? Like put a number down in terms of total sales, right? So um, I think people were putting down 50, 60, and my husband and I put 150,000, right? So can you, you see hmm. size? Okay, holy crap, you want to be at 150,000 in sales. And everybody else is at 30, 50, 60. Okay, how, how does a cooperative allow that to happen? And ultimately, that's actually what kind of broke us away from the co-op. It's just very different goals of how big we want it to be. Because when you're a big farm, like um, our greenhouses, if we wanted that much sales, we need to do a whole greenhouse in tomatoes, a whole greenhouse in um, snap peas. You know, we were doing production. And then the co-op itself had to absorb all that and find markets for that. At the same time, trying to help everybody else along. So those were some of the issues that happened for us. So in 2018, so after three years, when we started getting close to that 80 to 100 mark, um, Neil and I um, decided to leave the co-op. Um, so we're, we're on our own, but I'm still super committed to those principles of working together. Like, it just makes no sense. Um, and I should say one of the things that we did as a co-op, so that to ease the burden on everybody, we shared a lot of equipment. Mm. Like, <clears throat> we had at our farm already, 
We had a walk-in cooler. Can I tell you how much we paid for our work walk-in cooler? We found it on Craigslist for eight thousand dollars or eight hundred dollars. Mm. Sorry, and it's a big sixteen by twelve mm. walk-in cooler. So way more, way more than we needed. Mm. But the co-op then rented that um, that walk-in cooler. Uh, we had a wash station already at our farm, so the co-op rented the wash station. Mm. It also rented our truck to do deliveries and then paid for the gas and, and stuff like that. Mm. That way the other growers didn't have to build a wash station or find a cooler. Mm. Um, so basically, Merville Organics was a marketing co-op. Farmers were responsible for their own seed to harvest, and as soon as the crop was harvested, then the, the co-op took over. Hmm. So the co-op rented wash station space, cooler space, all your bags, your twist ties, rubber bands, um, paid for a, um, a delivery driver, paid for a um, accountant, like a bookkeeper, and then um, paid for a CSA manager. Hmm. Now, how did the co-op do that? Here's one thing that's sometimes hard for um, growers when you are dealing direct retail and you're able to absorb 100% of your sale, um, paying the co-op. So initially, we're you know growers, you want to try and keep your as much money as possible. We paid the co-op 15% on five, and at the end of the year, like we barely had $200, like. Maybe like it was just we just were able to cover all the costs of the co-op, and that required a lot of us to volunteer our time. Like we did the bookkeeping, mm. which is like farmers bookkeeping, <laughs> horrific. It was so bad, like so many unpaid bills we forgot to chase down, and it was just not good. Mm. Um, I don't know if any of you listen to podcasts. Um, there are a lot of farming podcasts, but one that I would always religiously listen to is the Farmer to Farmer podcast mm. by Chris, um, what's his last name? P Purple Pitchfork. He's passed away now. Mm. But he did do a, a podcast on cooperatives, and he had been mm. an extension agent in the U.S. for years and years, and he'd come to the realization that the, the most successful co-ops, their, um, their fee for their members was around 23%. Yeah. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, there is the magic number. So mm -hmm. we just put that into our co-op. So we raised it from 15 to 23, and all of a sudden we went from $200 at the end of the year to 10000 Right. Like, there was money in the co-op. That's a, the co-op, uh, that's a, uh, an aggregator yeah. in Duncan yeah. went and raised their, their operating fees to 23%. Yeah. I and wonder then, if they listen to the same thing. Well, place. it's funny how the same number is like a magic number. It, it just works. There's something magical about it. Yeah. So, you know, when you think about all of the money that you do spend on bags and, and rubber bands and twist ties and not having to use your time and energy to do your deliveries and your invoicing and all of that, like 23%, I know it's like a quarter of your profit, it sounds like a lot, but it, honestly, it was so worth it. Um, and it was worth it because we felt the value from the co-op, right? I was so happy not to have to do all the marketing. Like, So here's how much like our, our co-op, at the end of it when we left in 2015, 150 CSA shares, wow. five markets a week. Wow. I mean, wow. crazy, crazy. And each of us took two, and then the other mar you know, the other um, farmers each took two. <laughs> so I didn't have to do another eight. Like that in its own was worth 23%, right? <laughs> um, and then the payments for all of the other stuff, like I didn't have to worry about paying for rubber, but like all of that stuff is, <laughs> it accumulates on top, right? So um, a co-op obviously has to have a value to its members. And we all felt that value. Having done it all ourselves, by ourselves, 23% at the end, well worth it, yeah. And then at the end of the year, when you've got 10,000, you decide, well, what do we want to spend this on? Do we want to upgrade any infrastructure? And, you know, we, we pay for a couple of things, but in the end, when we, um, after it was all over and there was still money left, we got dividends back. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like in December, Christmas time, right? You get some money back from your co-op, which is awesome. So, yeah, that's that was one of the nice things for sure. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far mm -hmm. on like how how we did the co-op? Just I did. Uh, so we're um, not all the people in the five. Yeah. Like where were the property? Was the property all the same spot, like here? No. Or was it just like scattered across Everyone the city? Everyone had their own farms. Okay. Yeah. So this was like a, you know one of the differences. Each of us had our own properties, our own farms. Some were owned, some were leased. Like they, they, we all had something different going on. So we each had our own individual farms and farm identities and names. But during the time we were part of the co-op, no one really knew whose product was what. Like it was all mm. verbal organics. Right, because it was all combined. So were you necessarily sharing things like a BCS machine, like what yeah. have you? Okay, so you just yeah. had to like plan ahead to say, okay, yeah. this week I have it, and yeah. somebody would come get it, or okay. Yeah. Hmm. Get it, bring their trailer. That's the co-op, yeah. cooperative. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that doesn't necessarily have to be part of the co-op, but it was something that for sure we all um, we used and, and helped each other out on. I mean, the thing is, there are obviously some responsibilities and that you need, like, if you're sharing machinery, it needs to come back cleaned, and if you've done, if you, there was a ding, you need to tell us, you know, what happened, so that if anything needs to be fixed, we can, you know, figure it out, but, yeah, we would share, share equipment for sure. Um, I, I have two questions, one about the equipment, like, like this BCS, um, did somebody own it and then the co-op rented it? Now, for us, that it was more an informal sharing of the BCS. But I do know, like um, in the Kootenays, um, Kootenay Agricultural Society has a tool share co-op. Hmm. So you pay, you pay to be a member, and then you have access to that tool. Um, when you want to rent that tool, you have to rent it plus a trailer. You're not going to be putting this in the back of your truck. You're going to, you know, trail it around properly, and then they have a list. Of, there's an agreement of how how you rent this. I think it's a minimum two days, so that you're not crushed. And then here's where it comes back. It lives like the, the equipment doesn't live in one spot. I think different farms hold different equipment, so okay. then it has to be returned to this spot. And so in this shape, it. yeah. So they've got a really good agreement. So it, when you sign up. Um, this piece of equipment, you have to read this and check it off before, mm. you know, yeah. Okay. And my second question, when you left the cooperative, was there, how did you do that, like the legal ramifications yeah. and all that kind of stuff? Um, basically, we just, um, to be a member of a co-op, you, um, you pay a sh like a share, like you have to buy um, a share. Um, and at the time when we first started, shares were 100. By the time we left, the value of the share was 500. So we basically had our 500 returned to us. Um, and that was about it. Like there was some equipment that was being stored on our farm. So that got picked up. Bins, that's another thing. Like 150 share CSA, there were a lot of bins. This, 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 um, the co-op owned all the bins. So mm. we didn't have to be individually buying stuff. Mm. So the bins were picked up and, and moved. It's extricating yourself is not a huge thing. Yeah. Um, there's an AGM that happens, a formal AGM, and that's when you confer you who the membership is. So at the next AGM, our names were just taken off of the, the membership. Yeah. Part of your memorandum um, lays out the steps of how you enter and how you So in terms of um, the the farms all brought produce their product to your farm yeah. at, well, at the time when we were still yeah. in, and um, and the CSA was distributed from that location. And for things like like say if two different farms were doing Roma tomatoes, yeah. would they go into the the cooler from the two different farms, or would you just put them all together, or like how this? Like, so how here's, I mean, it's a lot of coordination. Yeah. I, I hope you you guys are into Google Docs. That's the only way we can mm -hmm. figure out how to make this work. We have a giant Google Doc, and then at the beginning of the week, 
every farm would list what crops they have available. Mm -hmm. um, we had a CSA manager who would come and take inventory out of availability and, and then reserve it for CSA. Mm -hmm. And then whatever was left over would either go to wholesale, market, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when product came into the cooler, it was labeled what farm it came from, what it was. Um, and then just in the cooler, it's now the, owned by the co-op. It's no longer so-and-so's stuff. Um, but that can be an issue in terms of quality control, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like if you're, and you know, it happened to us, I think our, our arugula was just so flea beetle. Like we tried picking out all the flea beetle arugula, but it was bad, right? And when we brought it to the wash station, people were like, oh, it's not looking great, right? So, you know, we got called, like, we just couldn't sell it through that. And sometimes, like, if there were green shoulders on the tomatoes, yeah, there would kind of have to be a quality control person. And you just have to be really frank with each other um, about, like, talking to them about their quality. I mean, it's tough, right? Farmers and their, their product, it's, it can be hard separating you from your vegetables, right? I have my <laughs> um, so here's an interesting thing, um, in about 20, yeah, in 2015 actually, or no, it was a couple of years later, 2017, um, I had the chance to go visit um, Bologna in Italy, where um, the state of Bologna has one of the highest concentrations of cooperatives in the world. And Van City um, studies there every year. To they take people to study cooperatives. So that year, they took farmers with them. So we were all learning about cooperatives. And like in Italy, cooperatives are protected uh, in the Constitution. They're written yeah. in the Constitution. There are all levels of government that deal with cooperatives. Like there are co-op initiators in every county or every district in mm. Bologna. Like, it's amazing. And I was kind of like, what is all of this, like, infrastructure? Like, this is crazy. Like, we just did it ourselves. Like, you know. And I would go to small co-ops and big co-ops, and there would be this level of management. Like, so we had a bookkeeper who was part-time. We had a part-time CSA manager and, you know, a couple of part-time people. But we, the farmers, were doing most of the thing. And I was like, wow. You're paying a lot for this level of management. I quickly understood why that happens. It's because of this issue of separating you and your product and the personality conflicts that can happen, right? Um, having a level of management there who say, who call you up, hey, you know, I just noticed your stuff isn't looking so great. It's not another farmer calling me, mm. it's the manager. Right? It's a little bit less, a bit of a distance, right, from you. Or, hey, did you pay your hours to do such as, like, it's not another farmer who's nagging you to do stuff. It's the manager. Hmm. So it's not your peer, it's yes. an authority. Yes. And that was really interesting. It took me a while to kind of like, why do they do that? Why do they have these paid staff people? Hmm. I mean, you're paying people a good, you know, a wage. It's coming out of your co-op fee, but why, why don't they just have farmers do all of this? Well, then I finally realized why. Yeah, it is so that peer-to-peer, -peer, you focus on growing, and then everything else is managed by the co-op. It is run like a, it's a business, right? That entity is a business. And, it, and it's in Italy, they figured out it has to be professionalized, hmm. and you have to take it like it's a good business. Some farmers markets work in that principle too, like the successful ones. There, um, there has to be like when you have a farmer as the farm manager or the market gardener or market manager. It's uh, it's uh, it's hard to tell another farmer Absolutely. and uh, or another vendor that they got to change or whatever. It's uh, it's like it's competition and. Uh, so on. Yes. I wonder the one up in Comox is it? Uh, do you have a farmer or a manager for your market? You know, we we left in 2018. We did not leave on great terms. Oh. So I haven't. I mean, they're still running. Um, I don't see. You know, I don't deal with them uh, on a buying basis. I still get sometimes calls because we have a um, one-acre blue 
the berries at our place. Right. And Merville Organics would like to put fruit in. So I'd get a call, but it would be from one of the other growers. I don't think they initiated that level of management. But mm. I just want to point it out that a lot of um, countries and obviously provinces like Bologna and Italy, where right. co-ops have a very, very long history, have figured out that this is the way that you should go. Mm. So maybe trust that they figured mm. stuff out right. and you may want to head in that direction. Right. Yeah. So... I mean, that's a formal cooperative. And I don't want to dismiss the idea of just working as a collective as well. Because um, that's a possibility too. It's a lot less structure and it's a lot, you know, fewer rules. Um, it will obviously get a bit messier if there are persona personality issues or conflicts or something happens. But it may be a baby step to getting into a formal co-op or you may just like, um, want to keep it at a really loose association. So since we left our co-op and we wanted to continue to grow, one of our markets is actually in Tofino. So we sell to the Tofino Chefs Guild, as do a couple of other farms in the Comox Valley. And, you know, obviously paying for the freight all the way there is expensive. So, you know, the three of us decided to split. You know, there's no formal agreement. One of the farms does pays the actual bill, and we just pay them. Mm. You know, it's a really mm. informal agreement. I don't know if we need to formalize that any more than it is. Mm. It's just a really simple. Let's we'll just split the bill, right? And regardless of who sends what and how much and what the value is, we just agree to like, okay, thirty bucks. Like, thank God I don't have to drive to Coon. Well, I have to say, right? Which is the mm. other choice. I can just you know, come to the farm in Comox Bay, and there's the truck. Off. So we've just agreed to work on that that way. Mm. Um, you know, coming up in COVID times, I'm thinking like labor is going to be a really big issue. So many farms in the Comox Valley depended on woofers or help X, and those folks are not necessarily going to be available. I think sharing labor with within farmers may be an answer to that. Mm. So that be another way of loosely associating a collective, like, you know, one day a week mm. we, or once, maybe once a week, we all descend on this farm and help them do whatever needs to be done. Mm. Usually it's going to be the low value weeding, you know, thinning, something like that, right? Yeah, bed prep. Whatever, right? You just go and you help each other out. I have a feeling there'll be more of that, like labor sharing. Um, and I think you're going to be studying Turn to Sol Farm in Quebec mm -hmm. a bit more. Theirs is a labor co-op, right? Mm. So whereas ours was a marketing co-op, whereby we had to keep track of the value of our product going into the co-op, um, we had like this huge Google Doc of how much and at what price everything was going in um, so that we could be paid for the value we sent in. Um, a, a labor co-op or a, a worker co-op basically, you really have to track your hours. Um, and you know they were helping us out in the beginning and they were asking us to track our labor and we were like, what? Like, wh why? Like, this doesn't make sense. Well, that's because how that's how they get paid mm. in, in turn to solve. It's how many hours you've put in. To All right. Off, right. So just be aware of what your metrics are. Mm. Um, if it's our labor hours or if it's product, that's what you need to really keep track of. So record mm. keeping will be different depending on what the metric is. Right? So in the labor co-op, everybody decided what they were going to make. And then they all got the same well, equal amount. I think amount. they decided on a per hour. Right. Um, and then they had generally like everybody put in twenty, like twenty-ish hours. Is right. What the minimum they were expecting. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I would expect that if you double that, there might like alarm bells might go off. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you putting in so many hours? Are you just being inefficient? Like, what's going on here? Or did we underestimate how long this this job? Would so, but, but this, that one big farm, though, that's yes. why they're tracking the hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they all work together on one farm. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And do you grow to order? Like, did you do that at all with the, with the cooperative The model? grow to order was for the CSA. Just for CSA, yeah. not for restaurants. And no, and that's one of, one of the reasons we did leave, is we needed more, so there, it was like painful how we had to like plan the CSA yeah. week by week, what, what we thought would go every week, and you know, if you've ever done a CSA, your customers don't want the same thing every week, right? It's boring. So every week something different had to show up into the CSA. So planning that was excruciating. We did it for 16 weeks, and then we did another fall CSA. Like it's, uh, took like days and days of sitting together and hashing it out. After that, nobody wanted to plan anything else. And so the market ended up where all the extras were kind of dumped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the last um, year we were in the co-op, we grew uh, about 1,200 pounds of squash. Um, and unbeknownst to us, another farm grew 700 pounds. And like our market can barely sell for uh, at our stand like 60 pounds at a time, right? So we had to take a big hit and wholesale yeah. it, send it elsewhere, yeah. just because we didn't plan that. The, there was just so much resistance to doing any more planning, though. And it was like, oh, yeah. God, no, we can't do this anymore, right? So, yeah. Um, so grow to order. I mean, yeah. I'm finding there aren't a ton of rent. Like, restaurants and even wholesalers sometimes are really reluctant to commit to certain amounts. Like, now that we've been working in one of our health food stores, you know, for the last couple of years, I know approximately what they want, and they know our product, we know what the sales are like. Mm. Um, but every year is different. Like this year, if I could sell, like, if I could have grown a hundred bunches of cilantro a week, I would have sold them. Like, I, I don't know what was going on with cilantro this year, but obviously there was maybe none coming in from, I don't know, but we could have sold every last drop of cilantro. Mm. We just but I don't know if that was something they knew in advance. We didn't know. So constantly shorting the market. And yeah, so it was a lot. Yeah. But now we know. Like we, it's not so much to go to order, but we can look back at our records now and say, okay, we know Edible is taking 50 bunches of, of cilantro, so-and-so. Like we have an idea of how many bunches that will grow. Record keeping, I have to say, super important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need it for our organic certification anyways, and that's what really pushed us. Like, honestly, who wants to be on a Google Doc and spreadsheets? No one wants to. If you're doing, if you love farming, it's not the favorite thing. But I have to say at the end of the year, when you have like, oh my god, I didn't realize I grew this much, and you're able to kind of figure out what product, um, what are our top three or top ten sales, like what vegetables, what are the bottom ten, can we get rid of some of these, like we were growing over 50 different types of fruit and veg at one time, and we're slowly every year dropping things like black radishes, no more, like you know, there's certain <laughs> things that are cool to grow, yeah. but maybe not so profitable, right? yeah. Um, yeah, we use our spreadsheets that way all yeah. And I think for any kind of organization, if you are working collectively, record keeping is going to be a big deal. Mm. Yeah. So your farm now is a so your principal market is the CSA. No, our okay. principal market You're diversified? is actually, um, farmers market. Oh, the farmers market. Yeah. Okay, so. So yeah. I would say, like right now, yeah, probably about eighty percent of our volume goes to the market, and then um, you know after we left the co-op, I was like. I'm never gonna do a CSA ever again. Like, this is so horrible. Like it's it was traumatic for you know a while trying to like figure out whose stuff is where and you know oh, you, you didn't bunch enough carrots. Like oh my god, we gotta go run and find carrots from stuff. Like it was insane. 150 mm. shares, right? Um, but so many customers were asking for a CSA this year. Mm. Our Wednesday market ended like it was a midweek market in Courtney. It ended at the beginning of September. And we still had like cherry tomatoes and like stuff was still coming out. So we decided to do a fall CSA, mm. just 15 shares midweek so that we could keep our zucchini and beans mm. and stuff picked. And there's a 
market for it. We ended up accepting three extra folks, so 18. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've got a small CSA, and I think we'll just keep mm -hmm. it. I can't imagine going more than 30 shares. All right. Yeah. Reasonable. How much do you sell at a farmer's market in Comox? On a, on a weekly On a good day. I would say we are averaging, uh, probably averaging about $1,800 mm -hmm. market. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that's just your yeah. That's not the sale. Yeah. Um, when we were, no, with, with, with the CSA, like when we were at Smurf Organics, we were nowhere near that. Yeah. Something happened this year. I have to say, we hit, uh, I think it was in early July. One Saturday, we did 3,000 in sales. And I was just like, what? <laughs> who are all these people? And wh where did you come from? And who are you? Like, there, you know, the COVID kind of pent right. up um, yeah. food security, I need to eat local thing was really happening in June yeah. and early July. Um, but then everybody started going away on their summer vacations. Mm -hmm. Every, like, Tofina opened up and like, and then it, I was like, where is everybody? We grew more. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, we did, right? Yeah. Okay. Called up Bobby and Tofino. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cool. So um, that's the problem when you're dealing with market, right? It's it's fantastic amounts. You're keeping like our market charges five percent, which for a marketing fee is what so low. Mm. Um, happily give them that. But you know, if it rains, you know, you know, automatically we're going to be down three to four hundred dollars if it's raining, right? Mm. And if it's a long weekend, people are away. Okay, another two to three hundred. So, hard to mm. But it's a Wednesday night your market. Uh, only in the summer. Uh, but year round, we're on Saturday. Yeah. And it's a year round market. We, it only shuts for two weeks. Yeah. So it goes indoors. Mm. So the COVID outbreak never really affected you as much? Uh, Like, it felt really weird. Like, it was our market was still inside at the beginning of April, mm. and then when it moved outside, like I drove by the outside field, and I was like, "There's ten people there. Like, oh my god, our sales are gonna crash. Like, we're pulling our hair out. Mm. This is the eighty percent of our sales, and we were looking at the market going. There is no way we are going to be able to pay our staff and pay us. Mm. Like, holy smokes. So." Um, Built a farm stand. Hmm. We built a website. Like, thank God I have a teenager in the house. <laughs> like, it would have taken me weeks and weeks to build a website. Hmm. And, you know, shopping cart and stuff. It took, like two days. And the only reason it took two days is because I couldn't find photos. Like, you know, <laughs> um, and descriptions. And she just like, did it, set it up. Great. So we had, as our for our response, because we weren't sure what market was going to happen. Yeah, pull it in. It's so hot though. <laughs> so, is it hot? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so for sure it impacted us in the beginning, like the stress of not knowing like what market we're gonna do and mm. how are we gonna sell all of this food that we're growing. And then the opposite happened, right? Like there is so much like demand and like mm. Hmm. So we try growing more. And it's been crazy. Like oh. when we start once this year is over, like open some champagne. <laughs> this is going to be the weather. Yeah. Like how much rain can one summer have? It was insane. We, I mean, I've been growing garlic for twenty years now. Hmm. I've never seen a garlic season like this. Hmm. It was, hmm. Yeah. Just never 
Something green. It's like a weed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what so you've been pulling. <laughs> It's a little too much, yeah. Yeah. Um, So, yeah. Um, A 
just want to point out one other form of kind of working together collectively. Mm -hmm. I think you've got a farmer's institute here in the Yes, we do. Valley. I mean, yeah. that's another way of collectivism, but it's more around mm -hmm. learning and coming together to learn new techniques mm -hmm. or hear a speaker about a topic that you're interested in and maybe couldn't pay for that speaker on your own. Mm. That's another way that you mm -hmm. work together to pay for things. Like, you know, our institute charges 20 bucks um, a year. This year, we're probably going to waive that fee. Um, mm. And still want to bring in speakers that are helpful, just like this, like climate mm. change. What are some of the things that you're doing? Are there new crops that you're trying? Like, like for us, it's winters are cold. Summers, like maybe not the last two, but normally the summers are getting so hot. We stopped growing any kind of like beef steak tomato, just the sun <coughs> that was happening. Mm. So, um, but maybe crops like sweet potato, ginger, like there's some crops that we're maybe not commercially thought about that it would be worth investigating. Mm. Right? And as, an, um, like as a private farm or a co op, are you eligible for grants? Or are you still looking into? Um, not so much, right? Um, mm. If you have been in business for two years and can show a income of thirty-five thousand, um, you can access that business um, planning as well. Right? Yeah, but you've got to be at a certain level. Of it. Whereas I think co-op is necessary. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The government is really trying to encourage farmers to work together. I told them you need to give farmers more training in that communication and conflict management, like the soft skills that I think everybody would benefit from, but our Canadians, we just shy away from conflict, right? We just don't, we just don't want to go there. Yeah. Mm. I, I think part of the, the, the problem is that everybody wants to make as much money as possible so they can increase, so everybody knows everything. Yeah. And it's, it's letting go of that and working together, I think, is it is. Yeah. Who wants to stop growing salad mix and cherry tomatoes? Mm. And I'd rather grow purple tomatillos than and ginger cumbra because they're cool. Yeah. yeah. And different farms will have different labor. Like, you know, um, at my farm, we, we can afford to pay for labor. At other farms, not so much. Like, if you, you know each other now, I think, enough that some of you know that you each have different skills that you bring to the table, whether it bring, maybe you come with a whole family and they can all, like, you've got kids and they can all help at, you know, work, mm. or someone has, like, amazing social media skills and can post on Instagram and sell your product before it's even out of the ground, right? All of that is necessary to help a farm run. You each come with your own individual circles of influence that can come support your farm. Why the wasps getting that? Oh, he's just on her coat. I just thought I would take him outside. He, 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 yeah. He landed on you a couple times, but. <laughs> um, we have a, a few members of a collective here. Those ladies here. It's at uh, four. Four? Yeah. Four here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
you guys are growing stuff for the health initiative that I'm a part of. I see your CSA thing. For yeah. <laughs> for tomorrow, that Carly will be coming and picking up for the. Oh yeah, yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. So. So long. Yeah. yeah. Growing for a long time. <laughs> you know, one thing that I shouldn't understate. Um, I think consumers really like it when they see farmers working together. There, mm. that's another really big benefit. Um, uh, I looked at Merble Organics, it was almost like a really great incubator. And in some ways, maybe that's mm. the model that it should take. So I'm not sure how long Merble Organics is gonna continue being around, but mm. for an, a, a newly establishing farm, like to know that there's already a CSA customer base, like it mm. takes the marketing um, kind of weight off of your shoulders in a huge way so that mm. you can just concentrate on learning how to grow because when you're just establishing like there's so much you don't even know what you don't even know right mm. um, and it's so wrong <laughs> <laughs> here's here's like okay whatever you grow we will take it was almost you know that mm. for for herbal organics mm. and it was just like get yourself established figure yourself out if you have problems you know ask us we've we've been through this like let us know this kind of stuff like yeah um the other thing is we used to eat collectively, have dinner at least once a month with each other, breaking bread with each other, hard to stay mad with someone when you're eating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really important. Depends on how they chew. Yeah, no, it, it's it's important for sure. Um, yeah, I think it, it is the way forward, whether you do it formally or informally. Um, I really want to sort of the whole idea of farming by yourself, that should just be erased from every farmer. Like that there is no such thing. You know, even the farmers that broke the broke the West, right? Came here and colonized. They didn't do it on their own. Like, good God. There were like communities helped each other, right? You never farm well, I remember in history class when they were talking about like colonization and expanse of the farmers through through you know whatever upper and lower Quebec or not Canada yet or the states but they, they you know you have these four plots and in the middle of where the four corners meet in the middle that's where the four homesteads would be put and then they all built away so they were all kind of close to each other and there was a reason for that for like protection and community and, yeah yeah. <laughs> we've lost that sense. Like for some reason, we felt that we've had to do this all ourselves. Like and figure it out and buy your bootstraps. You know, mm -hmm. do everything. It's just it's it's not it's a myth. It's not something that should ever be on the shoulders of farmers to figure all this out themselves. And it's like we forgot because like yeah. in the museum here is um, I think it's a threshing machine that my great grandfather and a bunch of other farmers bought because they all shared it, like they all had pieces of equipment and they do the harvest together and share the equipment and I mean that kind of fell apart and every single farm had to have every, mm -hmm. an attachment for every tractor. And, and honestly yeah. that is what's doing farming in, mm -hmm. the need for us to each own our own thing, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. The, well it's, all, it's a bit of the capitalism, mm -hmm. like you know, there is this thing that I don't want to be beholden to my needs. I don't have to owe anybody stuff. The organic certification is hard because I know when we were working on that like 20 some years ago, um, it was really off putting. Like the guy from Courtney, I can't remember his name, he came and he looked at our farm and he was like, Oh, well, you can't lend your rototiller to your Uncle Ron anymore because it's going off the farm. Right? Oh, you can. You and just you have can't to wash it down. Right? And he was like, And you can't, um, you know, whatever. Like there's just all these things where you couldn't do this and you, you know, you couldn't have uh, treated fence posts. Well, we have five acres of treated fence posts. Who's right. coming up with the money yeah. to no. buy different if fence posts? If they're there, right? their grandfather did it. The rules have changed. Oh, oh really? that's good. So that's changed. Oh. Yeah. 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 Buffer zones. Yeah. What's that? Just a buffer zone. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Oh. yeah. So you've got like yeah. three meters of length that you have to stay away from. The yeah. 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 But I thought they checked on their neighbors, what see what they were doing, if they were doing anything. No, no, no. no. You have a, a paid inspector that yes. comes to your farm and goes it, through everything. Goes through everything. Yeah. yeah, you don't. There's not that peer-to-peer -peer thing anymore. Again, like having another farm show up at your place and it's like check 
out your seed variety and stuff. It, yeah. it, it's not that. It's not like that. Yeah, it was pretty disheartening. Yeah. And I remember going to a friend's farm. His parents had just bought it. They had like no history on the farm. Mm -hmm. And they were they were using Miracle Grow on their um, flower gardens for the wedding flowers. Yeah. And they were granted like a higher level of whatever than we were. And I was like, okay, we've been farming here for 60, mm -hmm. or no, at that time it was 50 years. Yeah. And that's like, it just <laughs> felt like a bit of a. Like, I don't know, who you know. And Absolutely. Yeah. Have a look at, again, Iopa, like our local our island um, producer. I mean, that's yeah. another collective, you know, coming together because we share the cost of the inspectors. Like, right. sometimes they have to charge extra mileage if you're going to, like, really far away places. Yeah. But, yeah, we, we pay for all of that collectively. Yeah. yeah. And do you feel like having that official certification benefits you like in terms of the charge yeah yeah not so much the charges because every time organic farmers raise their price i find everybody else does too mm -hmm. like so right i i charge three bucks a bunch of kale so do all the other non-certified organic farmers mm. so what we benefit mm. from is when people come to our stand yeah. and are you growing organic yeah we're certified here's the certificate like we display our certificate and mm. it's just like oh, no questions asked that's it right mm. you don't have to go through the skill right it's like okay i follow organic practices with that um we have uh edible island our local um uh, healthy store um, features certified organic food so they would not be buying the one if they are if they haven't been certified mm. um so it's opened a lot of marketing doors for us, for sure. I think Portal Burn is still behind. Yeah. In that regard, and even to you know, you can, yeah, most of the chefs out there and the restaurants are like, people assume it's organic and local already. Yeah. yeah. If, it's, if it's heirloom, it's got to be, right? Yeah. They're like, as, we're happy right now right. by look, if we can purchase more from Portal Burn. Love that. No, I am so surprised that I'm selling stuff and kind of popping over you guys. I, 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 I look forward to the day when Hug says, oh, we're all full. But, but the problem with, with, I mean, Bobby says, he says to me, Anna, like, there's no one that can provide the quantity, price point, okay. consistency, quality control. So here's another reason. And, and, and there is a, yeah. Here's another reason you may want to work together. Because I we came through the same issue when we first started working with Bobby. He wanted, um, this was 2016, um, 100 bunches of, no, 200 pounds of kale a week. Wow, that's a lot of kale. <laughs> that's an insane amount of kale. Yeah. And for me to put that much kale into production, like I can't even, it's more than a half an acre of kale, I think. So A, it screws with my rotations, like all that brassica. I have other brassicas too, but kale. Whereas mm. I could do 50 bunches. And with three other farms, they could easily do 50 bunches. Mm. If we collectively mm. could supply him. But I myself yeah. could not. And that's one of the big benefits that we found with Merville Organics because individually, none of us had that level of production but collectively we absolutely did and it was like you want kale in summer oh my god please like take right and all of us were able to send all our kale down to Tofino. Mm -hmm. similarly tomatoes like you know we maybe had you know 10 15 pounds each combined you know a 50 pound like bobby would be like oh yay i'm taking it all all I, yeah i would send them so here is the thing like it's almost similar at the farmers market if all four of us were side by side we're all competing with each other when we've got the collective table we're helping each other out like we're we're actually helping sales mm. of our stuff and then some when we combine. And it's the same thing at the wholesale level. Like, I find at the small level, at least in the Comox Valley, the market at the Comox Valley, it's, there's no crafts, right? It's only food. Um, there's maybe one or two soap people, but they have to use local ingredients. Um, everything else is food, either baked or 
grown. There are 85 vendors. We're all competing with each other for people's dollars, right? Now, if 10 of us combined and we started to sell to Bobby, like, here's another level of un unmet demand. Like, here we're competing with each other. Here we are helping each other mm. supply a demand that is yet, like, Cisco is meeting. Mm -hmm. Like, it would be awesome to bump Cisco off the island. Right. Yeah. 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 Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't recommend people putting in a full acre of kale. Ecologically, no. it doesn't make sense, no. right? Um, but, if you did, very oh, <laughs> but if you put in a quarter of that, and everybody just put in a quarter of that, and we we worked together and said, okay, we're going to send this product here because there's this unmet demand at the wholesale level. Like, absolutely, you get Cisco cables. But yeah, it's the working together. Well, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it.